Good morning. It's good to be here in God's house again. The comments that Steve made before about the table set up at the farmer's market is interesting. He wasn't sure of himself until he saw it could be done. Others were doing it. Well, we've, there are a lot of things that can be done that very often we're not sure of. Uh, Kathy brought her friends with us. It means we can all invite somebody and bring them along on a Sunday morning. I want to express a special word of thank you to the church for making last Sunday a special day for our family. Uh, the way you welcomed them and treated them, including that nice cake that you prepared for them, it really made things special. So I do want to thank you for your hospitality to all of us and for your loving embrace of the family. Thank you. Let's bow forward to prayer. Father, again, we give thanks because you have called us into your presence. We desire to worship you. We desire to give you praise and glory and honor. And you make it possible for us to approach your throne because in your love, remove the barrier of sin that had separated us from you. Thank you for that privilege. And as we now bow before your throne, accept our worship, and use this time to teach us, to help us to understand your word, to show us the way that we ought to live in response to your love. Help us to be witnesses to who and what you are and to what you have done. Amen. Now, I know you're all familiar with a guy named Martin Luther. And you can assume that one of the passions of his life was the word of God. After all, he translated the whole thing into German. In fact, it became the foundation of the German language in a way. <clears throat> but Martin Luther was a little bit of a poet along with that. But as I said, his passion was the Bible. And it said that he once wrote a little poem about his favorite subject. And this is the way it goes. The Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet it runs after me, it has hands, it lays hold of me. Now, whether or not you think that is great poetry, I don't know, but it does contain a great truth. The Bible is alive. The Bible is alive. You know, even the Bible itself agrees with that assessment. Uh, listen to the Apostle Peter when he says, for example, for you have been born again through the living and enduring word of God. Or the writer of the Hebrews puts it this way, for the word of God is living and active. Now, since the word of God is living and active, it clearly has the ability to speak to us in new ways again and again. And I personally have found that when I study a passage, even though I've read that passage many times before, when I come to it this time, there's a certain line or a certain comment or a certain thought that somehow feels totally new. It's almost as though I had never seen it before. And though it may be overstating it just a little bit, I would almost say that I can never look at the same passage of Scripture in exactly the same way twice. And I know that shouldn't come as a surprise, and yet I can't help it. At times it still does surprise me. And it just happened again recently 
when I read again this parable that we just read. Matthew 25, 14 to 30. And what struck me this time was not the overall message of the parable, but the statement that Jesus makes right at the end of it. In verse 29, where he says, for to every person who has something, even more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But the person who has nothing, even the little that he has, will be taken away from him. Now, I don't know how you react to those words when you hear them. But when I looked at those words this time, they were almost disheartening. Almost disheartening. Was Jesus really teaching that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer? That's what it sounds like, isn't it? Is he saying that the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and that this is part of God's plan, God's will? Now, when we look at the world around us, we may very well see that this is how things work out there. That statement does appear to be true to life. It does reflect much of society, much of what we experience day after day. You know, if one comes to our own economy in recent years, for example, one of the common complaints is about the income gap. I'm sure you've heard about it. You know, the gap between the rich and the poor, and we're told that it's constantly growing, that the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. Big companies are swallowed up by little, swallowing up little ones. Large corporations are driving mom and pop businesses out of business. And it's happening not just in our own country and other countries, it's happening internationally as well. So as I said, those words of Jesus appear to be true to life. But is this the message Jesus is teaching? Is this part of the message of this parable? If it is, that doesn't really sound like good news, does it? In fact, it seems to be the opposite. It seems to be unjust, unfair. And though we may expect this kind of thing in an unjust, corrupt, and sinful world, Jesus is talking about his kingdom. And aren't things supposed to be different there? Could he really have meant what he's saying, or did he have something else in mind? Well, as I thought about this, I obviously had to go back to the parable again, try to take a new look at it. And as I did, I began to notice some things that I really hadn't paid that much attention to before. And as I took note of those things, I found that they helped me put the whole thing into perspective. So let me share with you some of those things that I found. I don't think I have to tell the parable again, we just read it, but just take note again of the central elements. A man entrusts his possessions to three men. Two of them double their investment, one buries it, doesn't invest it, returns only what's been given to him. The first two who double their investment Hear the words, well done, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in managing small amounts. I will put you in charge of large amounts. Come on in and, and share my happiness. Come on in and share my happiness. The third guy, the little he had was taken, given to the guy who had the most. And it's at this point that this puzzling statement of Jesus comes in that those who already have will be given more and those who have nothing, even the little, will be taken away from them. 
And the question we're faced with is, how do we put all of this together so that we can hear the good news of the kingdom that Jesus intended for us? Well, let me suggest to do that, we have to take a couple of things into consideration. First, don't confuse a person's talents with the measure of that person's worth. Don't confuse a, the measure of a person's talents with what that person is worth. Note that all three of the servants, even though they were given different amounts, the measure of the talents was different. Each of them were given exactly the same opportunity. In other words, they were equally important to their master. They were all given the same opportunity. Same with the rewards. The five talent and the two talent guy, both were given the reward of being allowed to enter into the joy of their master. If the one talent guy would have acted in a similar manner as the other two, he would have had exactly that same opportunity. His reward would have been the same as well. We need to recognize a very important distinction here. God may give different talents, different abilities, different gifts, but underlying each and every one of them is the same love. In other words, our value to God as persons is the same. It doesn't depend on how smart we are or what the extent of our abilities is, or the amount of resources we have at our disposal, our value, quite simply, is derived from God's estimation of us. And what is God's estimation of us? It is that God loves each of us the same. Until about two generations ago, most nations determined the value of their currency, their money, in terms of the value of gold. Gold had a set, basically unchanging value. It wasn't traded on the open market the way it is today. And that way, there was an unchanging standard against which to measure each country's currency. You know, it was called the gold standard. Well, when it comes to our value as persons, we are on the God standard. We are worth exactly what God says we are worth. And God loves you. God loves you. He not only willed you into existence, he watches over you, he redeemed you, he has a home in heaven prepared for you. God loves you. The great Bible student and man of God of ancient times, Augustine, spent a great deal of time contemplating the love of God. And in his writings, he put a beautiful statement that is as wonderful as it is true. He said, God loves each of us as if there were only one of us to love. God doesn't love us more or less because of our abilities or our capabilities. He doesn't love us more or less because of what we bring in terms of resources or character. He loves us. He loves you because he is love. And because he is love, he gives us all of his love today, even as he did yesterday, as he will tomorrow. And it is that love which reaches out to each one of us, that love that determines what our value is. God loves us. In a biography of the Norwegian theologian Soren Kierkegaard, the writer talks about a time 
in Kierkegaard's life, when a realization came to him that deeply stirred his spirit. The way he describes it was that it was a summer evening and Kierkegaard stood on a little hill beside the sea. The sun was going down and he was watching the flight of the birds as they soared above him. And this is the way Kierkegaard describes that experience. He says, as I stood there alone and forsaken, and the might of the sea and the war of the elements brought my own nothingness to mind. And on the other hand, the secure flight of the birds brought to mind the word of Christ, that not a sparrow falls to the ground without the will of your heavenly Father. I felt all at once how great and how small I was. And those two great powers, pride and humility, joined hands and became friends. That's getting a true perspective on life. Our dignity, your dignity, comes from God caring for you. It doesn't lie in what you may do. It doesn't lie in what other people may say about you. It centers in the love of God for you as an individual. And God loves you as if you were the only one to be loved. So never confuse talents with the value of a person. Secondly, in this parable, we also find an indication of how God deals with us in that love. Let's face it, too many of us too frequently misunderstand and misuse the whole concept of love. Too often we confuse love with this kind of smothering kind of control that tries to direct every move of the other person. You know, you see it every once in a while in parents who don't want to give up control of their child. They make every decision for them. They choose every friend they're allowed to have. They determine how every penny is spent. They control where they go, when they go, what they do. And not just when they're little, but through their teen years and even beyond. And if you would call these people's attention to what they're doing, they tell you, well, I'm only doing it to protect them from their own foolishness. Well, that's not the way God's love works. His love is a trusting kind of love that expects us to mature and decide what's fitting and proper to do. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't give direction. Of course he does that. In Christ, he's instilled a new nature in us to guide the way. We, he's given us his word, the Bible. He, we've got the marvelous example of Jesus Christ in his life, and there's so much more in which God does give guidance. He's a loving father. He wants the best for us, but he doesn't stand over us every moment, forcing every detail of our lives. God is like the master in this parable. He invests us with responsibility and opportunity. He invests us with responsibility according to our abilities, but then he expects us to act accordingly. Now, of course, God is always present to us in love. He never leaves us alone. We can always turn to him for help. But by the very nature of his love, he respects our freedom. And therefore, it is our choice of how we respond to his gift of love as we see fit. This is the second thing we find in the parable. In this loving care that the Father shows us, there is freedom for us to grow through life's experiences. There is freedom as to how we respond to the Father's love. And so, when we consider those elements now, I think the words of Jesus can begin to take on some new meaning. Let me read the words again. 
For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who has not, even what he has will be taken from him. The more that Jesus is talking about here is not things. The more he's talking about is not a possessions, not abilities, not talents. He is talking about the most essential thing that he can bestow on each one of us, his love. His love. And when it comes to that, it is profoundly true that everyone who accepts God's offer of love and lives in that love will be given more and will experience it more and more, whereas anybody who closes themselves off to it is going to find that it will grow less and less and less. You know, love is a strange quantity. Unlike almost any other possession, it is meant to be shared and used. Because when it is, it expands. It becomes greater, becomes more. If you ever study a map of Palestine, you'll find that right down the center of Palestine, there's a river, Jordan River. Along its route, the Jordan River flows into two seas. The first sea it flows into is the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee has clear water, abundant life in it and around it. Animals come to drink from its water, fish are sustained in their life in the water, birds are abundant. Is filled with life. The second sea the Jordan River flows into is the opposite of this. Brackish water, no animals come to drink, no plant life on its shore or near its shore, no fish in the water. You hardly see any birds flying over it, and it's rightly named the Dead Sea. What makes the difference? Both are fed by the same river. Both are fed by the same water. But the Sea of Galilee, as it receives the water, allows it to flow out again. It doesn't keep it to itself. It lets it flow, and life is sustained. The Dead Sea, nothing flows out. Nothing flows out. It keeps it all and it leads to death. Even the life that's brought into it by the Jordan River soon dies. Well, when we open our li life to God's love, then he's able to open us outward to others in abounding ways. And as we pass that love on to others, it opens us up more and more to receive more and more of God's love. And it begins to flood our hearts and souls and give us real life. If we close ourselves off to God and others, the little that is there soon stagnates, spoils, evaporates, it's taken away. So do you begin to see the good news of Jesus' words? Regardless of how you see yourself, God loves you. Learn to accept that. In Jesus Christ, God has proven how much he loves you. Allow that realization to flood your life. Because when you do, his love will awaken love in you. And the more you allow God's love to come into your life, the more love you will have to share with others. And in this way, you will experience the truth of what Jesus says. To everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. God loves you. Are you living in that love? Let's pray.
Father, how great is your love for us. A love that spared nothing to reach out to us. A love that gave its all so that we might be able to live in fellowship with you. Father, how great is that love. Help us today that we open ourselves up to that love. Allow us to truly experience it and live in it so that your love may grow in us, flow through us, and be made known in this world. For we ask this in Jesus' name.